Today, a new season of Cleveland Guardians baseball kicks off as the Guardians start by hosting their division rivals, the Chicago White Sox, here to kick off the 2026 Major League season. Last year did not end the way the Guardians had hoped. After winning 111 games in the regular season, Cleveland fell short, losing in the ALCS to the Toronto Blue Jays in just five games. Before we get to the first game, we'll quickly recap the offseason and spring training. If you'd like a timestamp to just jump right into the regular season, I'll put one in the description. We started off by giving Kyle Lewis a big extension, even though he struggled in the playoffs. He was great in the regular season, and I felt he deserved to come back. Josh Bell was re-signed to a two-year deal for around $16 million. He's getting older, but he's still very good. Hunter Green was signed to a five-year extension, locking him up through arbitration, and then his first year of free agency. And along with him in the rotation, we added Dylan Cease to a one-year prove-it contract. He has struggled recently in Chicago, and I'm hoping this change of scenery can do him well. And then we re-signed Dansby Swanson, the playoff hero, to a one-year, $4.5 million contract extension right at the end of the offseason. I didn't think we were going to bring him back, but he is back. So it wasn't an overly eventful offseason other than Dylan Cease and some in-house moves, but we didn't lose some guys. Josh Naylor ended up signing with the Milwaukee Brewers. Ranger Suarez signed with the New York Mets, and then we let go of a lot of our relievers. Dylan Tate, we wanted to bring him back, but he signed with the Giants. Nick Sandlin was traded away to the Pittsburgh Pirates for an outfield prospect, and Bruce Dark Gratterall, who was under arbitration, was let go. He signed with the Atlanta Braves. So we've got a lot of questions with the bullpen, and we couldn't really add anybody because we are under budget. We're paying our guys so much money that we can't really afford to make any more moves. And if we're going to want to make a move, it's going to have to involve trading one of those guys who are on the expensive side. Because we're broke, we couldn't extend Alvaro Pena to a big contract. But now that he's got his deal lined up for this year, we can extend him. So we're going to give him a nine-year deal for around $130 million, locking him up through team control. And then I believe his first four seasons in which he'd be a free agent. So he is back for good. This is what the lineups are going to look like for spring training, mainly trying to get young guys and guys who are on the roster bubble some playing time. But the thing I'm really looking for is the pitching. We've got to figure out who our number five starter is going to be, and we've got to figure out who's going to be in the bullpen. All five of the guys in the rotation, along with Marcos Villalobos and Ricky Watkins, are going to be battling it out for roster spots. So as we simulate to the end of spring training, the team ended up doing all right, not bad at 15 and 15, exactly 500. The thing that I noticed was that the pitching was really good and the offense was just an utter train wreck. We had a team ERA at around 3.6, which is really solid, but we had a team batting average of 220, which is the second worst mark in Major League Baseball, only behind Texas. We had the fourth worst on base and the ninth worst slugging, giving us a team OPS below 700. So long story short, the offense was bad, whereas the ERA for pitching was in the top half, which is quite solid considering we mostly pitched depth guys and young players who are fighting for roster spots. So yeah, common theme here, not a lot of the young guys really played well. We had some guys hit for good power. Zane Rowley, for example, hit three home runs, but he also only hit around 160. Other than Tommy Madlock, who hit 327 and 55 at-bats, none of the guys on the roster bubble were all that impressive, at least in terms of batting average and OPS. The pitching, as you'll see here, I think we have a pretty clear group of guys who were above the rest. The guys who stood out for me were Daniel Espino, who, as you'll see here, will start the year as the number five starter. I thought Michael McGreevy did really well. And then I think we're going to have Taj Bradley start in the bullpen, along with rookie Fernando Villegas, who was one of our draft picks recently. He ended up performing very well throughout spring training. So that's what we're going to start with, Espino in the rotation, and then McGreevy, Bradley, and Villegas in the bullpen, with everybody else getting sent down to the minor leagues. We'll keep our eye on AAA to see which players are doing well. If Gavin Williams or Rambo Rodriguez or Ricky Watkins in particular play well, then I'll certainly be looking to give those guys a call up to the big leagues. I think Watkins, the lefty, is the name in particular to really watch out for. I really like him a lot. 
And then in terms of the bullpen, Umberto Guzman will be another player to look out for. As for the offense, I'd say the notable thing here is that we kept Tommy Madlock on the opening day 26-man roster. He'll mainly serve as depth to start the year, but I do want to get him playing time at some point because I do think he is a really good young prospect. I believe he's the second-ranked prospect in all of baseball right now, so I feel like we're not really doing our best with him by giving him a main bench role to start the season. But let's take a look at these lineups here. This is what we're going to be rocking with against righties. Pretty much the same group that we ended with last year. I mean, our offense is literally the exact same as last year, with the exception of Josh Naylor being gone and Tommy Madlock essentially taking his spot. So the lineups for the most part are pretty much the same. And obviously, again, we'll keep our eye on the minor leagues. We'll keep our eyes on guys like Madlock and some of the younger young players to see if they produce and whatnot. And then in terms of pitching, we already talked about it earlier, but Daniel Espino will be the number five starter to begin the year. He has produced at times over the last couple of seasons in the majors, although he's been inconsistent, but he did perform well in spring training. McGreevy will be the long reliever with Bradley and Villegas getting a middle relief role. The division is certainly going to be something to keep an eye on. Obviously, we're the favorite, but the White Sox and Tigers are always good. The Twins added Jordan Alvarez, and the Royals added Luis Robert and Austin Riley. So I think the AL Central is going to be very competitive, and if we can start off right with some early division series against, obviously, the White Sox, along with the Twins and the Royals coming up, then hopefully we can start well in the division, and just like last year, be in a position where we have the division pretty much locked up by the time we get to the All-Star break. The White Sox lost their superstar outfielder, Luis Robert. He signed with the rival Royals. So Chicago is coming into this season with minimal expectations, but they are still a very talented team. And we faced off against them in the ALCS only two seasons ago. Along with losing Robert, they lost some other faces, including shortstop Tim Anderson and starting pitcher Dylan Cease, who is obviously now here in Cleveland. Here's a look at the lineups. Here's a look at Cleveland's starting pitcher, the ace of the staff, Shane Bieber, who was a little bit disappointing last year, but I am confident that he will bounce back. And he wasn't bad last year, but just a little disappointing in comparison to what he's done over the past few seasons. So let's get season number five started here with Austin Meadows up for the White Sox. He goes down looking on the knuckle curve. Good pitch right down the middle by Shane Bieber. Quick 1-2-3 inning for Bieber Fever as we go to the bottom half of the inning. Shane McClanahan, the lefty, getting the start for the White Sox. Dylan Cease would have been the ace, but, you know, he's gone. He's ours now. And it'll be McClanahan instead, who was a lot better than Dylan Cease a year ago. The lefty killer, Ramon Romero, getting right to work. The third-year pro hits that one into left. One hops off the wall. And that will be a double for the 21-year-old second baseman. He can now legally drink. Good for him. So Ramiro is now in scoring position. Two away here for Kyle Lewis. The $57 million man gets a hanging pitch up and away. And he capitalizes as that one will bounce over the fence for a ground rule double. Run scores. Cleveland leads 1-0. In the top of the second, here's Gavin Sheets. He will draw a walk on the inside slider, so Chicago gets their first base runner of the day. That'll bring up Glaber Torres, who lines it to second. Ramiro to Marte, over to Ramirez to turn the double play. No Josh Bell at first. He's not going to play against lefties a whole lot this year because he really struggled against left-handed pitching a season ago. Alvaro Pena, in his first full season in the big leagues, up here in the second, and his first at-bat of the season will result in a strikeout looking. He appears to be pretty angry at the umpire. Dansby Swanson now up, the playoff hero from last year and the year before. Remember when he hit the big grand slam against these White Sox? He draws a walk and is now on base here with one away for the young outfielder George Valera, who did perform pretty well in spring training, unlike most of his teammates, but he grounds into an inning-ending double play. Good work by the Chicago infield as it remains 1-0 going into the third. JT Romuto leads it off for Chicago. He hits this one high and deep in the left field, and this one is gone. Solo home run for JT Romuto, and this game is tied at 1. That one was gone really as soon as it hit the bat. Everybody in the stadium knew that ball was out of here. Michael Chavis looking to follow up on the act, but he will go down looking on the fastball up and away. 
Let's go bottom three. Ramon Ramiro up for Cleveland. Base hit and a run on his last at bat as Ramiro belts that one up the middle for another base hit. That 99 contact against left-handed pitching is really coming into use right now as Ramon Ramiro is two for two. Jose Ramirez, the reigning American League MVP, hits this ball high and deep in the center field, back at the track, at the wall, it is caught. An anticlimactic ending to the third inning. They have Eloy Jimenez playing center now. I feel like that idea is just destined to crash and burn. Nonetheless, he makes the play. It's still tied at one going into the fourth as Austin Meadows starts the inning by drawing a walk. So the White Sox have a base runner. That'll bring up Eloy Jimenez. He must have heard me talking smack about his defense, but we know Eloy can certainly swing the stick as he singles in the left. Two runners on, one away now for Glaber Torres. Clobbers it in a left center field, and this baby is gone. Three-run homer for Glaber Torres, and the White Sox take a 4-1 lead. Certainly not what you want to see there from Shane Bieber, who really was pitching well early, but the Shane train is quickly starting to fall off the tracks. Romuto belts that one, deflects off of Marte. That'll end up as a base hit. I know it's a tough play, but can tell Marte's got to hold on to that ball. That'll bring up Michael Chavis now. Singles into center. Still only one out, by the way. Shane Bieber is getting absolutely rocked. Right now, Cleveland's got to have the bullpen getting loose because he is not pitching well. That'll bring up Bryson Stott, and he goes down on the knuckle curve. Nice pitch by Shane Bieber, trying to get out of this jam as he faces off against Riconde Diabokulis. Grounds it to short. Marte flips it over to second. So the White Sox leave two, but they also score three. Chicago leads comfortably four to one. Shane McClanahan very quietly has been pitching really well today. He's only allowed one hit since the first inning. Is he'll get another 1-2-3 inning here, getting Alvaro Pena fooled on the curveball as it remains 4-1. Shane Bieber's leash is like unbelievably short. As he allows a base runner, he's probably out of the game. And boom, he walks Brandon Nimmo to start the fifth. And with that, Shane Bieber's day is going to be done. Four innings, four earned runs so far. Just not his outing. And hopefully Bieber can pick it up. He only pitched in one spring training game. Maybe Cleveland should have given him a little bit more playing time and more innings to get loosened up. He'll be replaced by the rookie, Taj Bradley, making his big league debut. Cleveland used him as a long-term starting pitcher, but with their lack of relievers, he's going to be getting bullpen work this year. And his first at bat is going to be allowing a base hit. So Chicago gets another runner aboard, 2-1, nobody out, and a huge opportunity for Eloy Jimenez. for 1-2, Jimenez rips it down the line and fair. One run should score. That's going to be an RBI single for Eloy Jimenez with Austin Meadows now at third, and it's 5-1. So far, not good for Taj Bradley, but he does get Gavin Sheets to go down looking on the curveball for the first out of the inning, his first career major league strikeout. That'll bring up Torres with the homer in the last inning, grounds it to Ramiro for an inning-ending 4-6-3 double play. I guess it could have been worse. The White Sox got a couple base runners on early, and they only score one, but nonetheless, they do extend the lead 5-1. Shane McClanahan is still cooking. Facing off against George Valera. That would have been ball four, but Valera goes down fishing, and he didn't catch anything with that beat. That'll bring up the young catcher, Eliezer Alfonso, the former World Series MVP. A one-two pitch, and he goes down looking on the low fastball. Another one-two three inning from Shane McClanahan, who is absolutely dealing right now. Ryan Weathers is into the game for Cleveland. In 120 innings last year, he was quietly very good with a sub-3 ERA and a sub-1 whip. And he would retire the side, a 1-2-3 inning, as Bryson Stott will fly out to center. Caught by Jesus Sanchez. Good work by Weathers, and we go to the bottom half of the inning. Can tell Marte trying to get something going for Cleveland, but he looks at the low and outside fastball. That pitch looked out of the zone, but the umpire says otherwise. That'll bring up Ramon Romero. He draws a walk, so at least Ramon Romero's been good. He's reached base on all three of his at-bats. The problem is the rest of the offense has played like garbage. That'll bring up Jose Ramirez now. He hits this one high and deep in the right center. Back at the track of the wall, it's caught. Cleveland's had three or four good of the warning track today. They have been quite unlucky in terms of near-home runs. That'll bring up Kyle Lewis, who is the only run batted in today for Cleveland. Hits this one in the right. This one's got a chance, and it is caught. 
That's five scoreless innings for Shane McClanahan. He's only allowed one hit since the first inning. Absolutely dealing. We'll see if they keep him in for another inning. Fernando Viegas, the rookie, is in for Cleveland, making his big league debut. He performed very well in spring training, but his day will not start off great. As his first at bat is going to be a base hit, a single into right field by Riconde de Bocchilis. So he is aboard to start the frame. That'll bring up Brandon Nimmo now. It's this one into left. That's going to drop possibly for extras as Nimmo will waltz in a second for a double. And the White Sox have two runners in scoring position with nobody out. So far, a disastrous start in the big league career of Fernando Villegas. That'll bring up Austin Meadows. He will ground it to Ramirez, flips it over to Villegas. From the first out of the inning, but a run scores. It's now 6-1 to one with the other runner at third. Eloy Jimenez rips it in a right for a single, and it's now 7-1. Villegas has allowed two here in his first big league inning, and things continue to get worse and worse for the Guardians. Now Gavin Sheets is up, flies it into left, and it is caught! What a catch by Jesus Sanchez! Wow! A Sports Center esque top 10 catch! I know there hasn't been a lot to smile about for Cleveland today, but hey, that was pretty awesome! potentially robbing the White Sox of an extra base hit. Maybe a run scores there because the center fielder really wasn't nearby. And then the following batter grounds it to third. Swanson makes the play. Good end of the inning, but the White Sox score two as this game continues to look more and more like a rout. 7-1, Chicago on top. Let's go to the bottom of the seventh now. Alvaro Pena will single into right field. Pena wants to be aggressive, tries to go for two, and he is out of there. So Pena tries to get ballsy. It backfires. Yeah, it's been one of those days here for Cleveland. Full count for Swanson. See, I wouldn't want to be ya. He goes down on the changeup. Let's move forward to the bottom of the ninth. Nothing overly eventful happened in the eighth and then the top of the ninth. It remains 7-1. to one. Jesus Sanchez is up for the Guardians. He's 0-3 today. Make it 0-4. A pop-up behind home plate. It will be caught by Romuto. And the White Sox steamroll past the Guardians here on opening day. 7-1, your final score. It's obviously not time to panic. It's game one of 162. I will say I'm a little bit concerned that the bad mojo from the ALCS last year has carried over. And since we've pretty much run it back, at least on offense, with the same guys in the lineup, I feel like the momentum from last year's playoff exit is still there. You're not going to win many games when you don't hit well and you don't pitch well. I think the offense deserves a majority of the blame here. Ramon Romero was really good. Two for two with a walk. He reached base on all three at-bats. He scored the only run. But everybody else was not good. Two hits and one walk from the rest of the team. And the pitching wasn't great either. Shane Bieber struggled. The bullpen was fine other than Viegas and Taj Bradley was a little bit inconsistent. But the other three relievers were all pretty solid. Let's simulate up to the series against Toronto. A rematch against the Blue Jays. We are hungry for blood. So we ended up doing solid in that stretch, going 7-5. and five. We only took one against Chicago, but we won 2-3 in the other three series is against the Twins, Royals, and Rangers. We lead the majors in batting average, rating 292. We have a walk to strikeout ratio of 52 to 72. Both of those are in the top three. We have a top five ERA and the best fielding percentage in baseball. So why are we only seven and five? Well, we are hitting for no power. We're 22nd in slugging, which is impressive because keep in mind we're first in batting average. So we are basically hitting for no power. We're tied for 27th in home runs, which is 8th. We're tied for 21st in doubles. So the guys are getting hits. They're getting on base, but they're not hitting for any power, which is not, you know, ideal. So let's hop into this matchup here against the Blue Jays. They have gotten off to a rough start this year, currently 5-8, and eight, reeling over the loss of their two best players, Bo Bichette, who signed with the Mariners, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who signed a big contract with the Los Angeles Dodgers. So they've lost a lot of talent and so far are not doing all that hot. And if they continue to struggle, they may not make the playoffs, which is not necessarily bad news for us. 
Here's a look at both lineups for each side. You may notice Bobby Bradley, the former Guardian, hitting cleanup for Toronto. That's how desperate they've gotten. Hunter Green is on the bump through two starts. He's 1-1 one one of the 3.38 ERA. So far, so good, although it's obviously a very small sample size. Facing off against the leadoff man at Alberto Montesi, who performed very well in the ALCS last year against Cleveland. He goes down looking on the fastball to start off the game. That'll bring up the first baseman, Garrett Cooper, hitting 714, but he will strike out on the changeup. Good pitch by Green, his second K of the day. Walter is starting for Toronto. Yes, the same Walter who pitched in the decisive game five and thus eliminated Cleveland from postseason contention. Facing off against the Blue Jay killer, Cattell Marte, who didn't kill anything except for maybe his bat. He will ground out to third. Good play by Toronto. No score, no base runners for either team so far. That'll change here of a David Green walk. So he is aboard with two away here in the top of the second. That'll bring up the big fella, Alejandro Kirk, and he draws a walk as well, juking out of the way to not get hit by the slider. So now there's two on, two away for Paul DeYoung, and he goes down on the fastball. Nice pitch by Green to end the inning despite allowing two late walks. Still no score going into the bottom of the second with Jose Ramirez leading it off for the Guardians. He's been pretty solid this year. He is one of two players on the team with multiple home runs, but he does strike out looking on the fastball. Steven Duggar leads off the third for Toronto, and he leads it off with a bang. This one is gone and right, and the Blue Jays take a 1-0 lead. Great swing there by the lefty Duggar in the nine hole with his second home run of the year. Let's go bottom three. Walter McGee still pitching a perfect game. Luis Camposano looking to change that, however. He's only hitting 120 so far this year, but he will up his average with a single into right field. So Cleveland finally gets a base runner here. They haven't hit for much power this year. Today they're not hitting for power or contact, and that is a problem. Apparently, they're not hitting for discipline either. Zane Rowley might as well have put a blindfold on with how big his strike zone was on that pitch. Let's go to the fourth. Two away for Kirk. He goes down looking on the changeup. Hunter Green really is balling for the most part. It's a shame that the offense is putting that to waste up to this point. Trying to change that here in the bottom half of the inning with Josh Bell up having a pretty good start to the year, hitting just under 400 through the first 12 games, but he will ground out to third. Really nice defensive play there by Adalberto Mondesi. Paul DeYoung leads off the fifth. DeYoung, if it's fair, it's gone, and it is gone. Solo home run under the concourse and left, and the Blue Jays lead two to nothing. I'm getting flashbacks from the ALCS from last year. Toronto seems to have this team's number. Cooper with two away, grounds out to Ramiro. Solid inning from Hunter Green, minus the home run. He's still under 70 pitches. I imagine the Guardians are going to look to keep him in for another inning as we go to the bottom of the fifth. Kyle Lewis is up for Cleveland. Full count pitch. He draws a walk. Thought about it, but he holds back, which ultimately is certainly the wise decision. So he is aboard on first 2-2 pitch now for Pena. A blast into left center field, and this game is tied at two. A sick bat flip. For Alvaro Pena's first home run of the year. Wow, what a swing. That might be the best swing of his big league career up to this point. Oh, me. Oh, my. A no-doubter off the bat over 440 feet. We got to look at that one again. Just an absolute beauty. He's got such a sweet stroke pause. And the bat flip was a nice cherry on top. 434, excuse me. I may have rounded over a little bit. But yeah, that was a total moonshot. That'll bring up Ramon Romero now. The 2-2, he goes down looking on the fastball. Nice pitch by Walter. And Ramon is pretty ticked off about it. That'll bring up the catcher, Luis Campusano, who got a base hit in his last at bat, looking to do so again as he gets that one over the glove of the shortstop for a single into left field. So Cleveland's offense is really starting to wake up. It took a little while, but I think they're here. Zane Rowley belts it up the middle for a single into center. Two on, two out, with the heart of the order due up. A huge opportunity for Cleveland to add some more runs and look to take this lead. Josh Bell is now up for the Guardians, and he strikes out on the high fastball. Good pitch by Walter McGee to get out of the jam. 
But Cleveland does score two to tie it up off of the two-run shot by Alvaro Pena. Into the sixth, the Blue Jays are going to look to get their lead right back, and they will. A solo home run for the former Guardian, Bobby Bradley, and it's now 3-2. to two. It's a shame things didn't really work out with Bradley here. He was traded away in the offseason to Toronto. He's hitting .98 so far. His average is quite low, but he does now have two home runs on the season. With that, Green is taken out of the game. He'll be replaced by Camilo Duvall, who's been pretty busy so far. Seven innings, two runs allowed. Not too bad. He's been quite solid to start the year. Jason off against Jorge Soler to start things off, and he goes down on the 98-mile-an-hour fastball for the second out of the inning. Green got the first out. Speaking of players with the name Green, here's David Green, who swings and misses at the slider. So a solid inning for Duvall, but Hunter Green does allow a home run to Bobby Bradley, making it 3-2. Robert Gesellman is in for Toronto here in the bottom of the sixth. Jason off against Cattell Marte, who has been unusually quiet against Toronto, but now he's going to make a play. Shoots that one into the gap out and left off the wall for a double. Marte slides into second safely. He is now in scoring position, and Cleveland has a real opportunity to tie or even take the lead. Jose Ramirez is up next. He hits this one into the other gap in a right center. Marte should score with no problem. It's going to be an RBI double for Jose Ramirez as he walks to second with ease. And this game is tied at three with still nobody out. Kyle Lewis is now up. Belts it down the line. Good play by Garrett Cooper to deflect it over to Selman. Jose Ramirez surprisingly holds up at second. He probably could have gone to third there, but he ultimately chooses not to. Two away now for Alvaro Pena. He homered in his last at bat looking to do some more damage, but he goes down looking on the inside slider. Nice pitch by Selman. So Toronto adds a run in the top half of the inning and the Guardians answer with one in the bottom half. Taj Bradley comes into the game now. He has not pitched since opening day. He's been quiet, but he has not allowed a run yet, technically. He'll face off against the catcher Alejandro Kirk on the 1-2. He goes down on the low and inside fastball. Nice pitch on the left bottom corner by Bradley. Now facing off against Paul DeYoung. Homered earlier in the game. And he goes down fish on a curveball way below the strike zone. Filthy pitch from Taj Bradley. Showing off some of his nasty stuff for the second out of the inning. Can he strike out the side? Yes, he will. It's Duggar who goes down on the fastball. So a trio of Ks. Don't put those letters in a row, however. Good inning from Taj Bradley as we go to the bottom of the seventh. Seth Lugo is in for Toronto, 2.89 ERA and nine and a thirds innings of ball so far as he faces off against Zane Rowley with two away, 3-1 pitch. Rowley gets one he likes, but he grounds out to second as David Green will make the play. So no blood drawn here in the seventh, and it remains tied at three with two innings to go. Alex Vesia, the lefty, is now in for Cleveland. He's not allowed a run in an inning and two-thirds so far. The Blue Jays only have three hits today, while the Guardians only have six. Well, here's another hit for Toronto. A homer in a left center gap by Garrett Cooper, and it's now 4-3. to three. Cooper specialized against lefties last year, but with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. gone, he's now the full-time first baseman, showing off his great ability against left-handed pitching there. Kevin Biggio belts that one down the line and fair for a double. Rough start here for Alex Vesia. He is getting rocked right now by the Blue Jays. We'll see if Cleveland trusts him to stay in the game. It looks like they will as he faces off against the power hitting outfielder Jorge Soler. Full count with two away. He goes down looking at the fastball right down the middle. I don't know what he was waiting for. Not a bad inning though for the Blue Jays. They take the lead back 4-3. Jordan Romano is now in for Toronto. He'll face off against Josh Bell to start the inning. 3-1. Bell draws a walk. So he is aboard. So that'll bring up Cattell Marte, the Blue Jay killer. He's been pretty quiet today, but I guess he wanted to wait to make a play. Marte with a moonshot. 450 into dead center. And Cleveland leads it 5-4 as Marte is flying around the bases. The dugout is fired up. Marte with his second home run of the year. He is now one of three players on the team with multiple home runs, which apparently is an accomplishment considering this team has hit for no power so far this year. But still, what a great play. 
by Cattell Marte. That'll bring up Jose Ramirez, the reigning American League MVP. Looking to do some more damage here in a full count pitch as this one is hit high and deep into the left field. Back at the track at the wall. See ya. It is gone. Solo home run for Jose Ramirez, his third of the year. Unlike Cattell Marte and Alvaro Pena's homers from earlier in the game, that certainly was not a no-doubter, but still a big play nonetheless. Marte and Ramirez go back-to-back, -back and the Cleveland Guardians lead 6-4. to four. It's good seeing the power and the offense finally show up today. As Romano's taken out of the game, he'll be replaced by Tim Maeza, who famously almost lost his nuts last year in the ALCS against Cleveland when a home run went directly into Toronto's bullpen when he was warming up. Alvaro Pena strikes out to end the inning, but still a really good inning of ball from Cleveland as they score three runs. Two-run homer by Marte, solo home run by Ramirez, and Emmanuel Classe, the all-star closer, is in for the save. Classe's only got three pitches, the cutter, the slider, and the fastball. There's the cutter. It gets green to strike out. Good start. That'll bring up Alejandro Kirk. There's the slider up and away for the second out of the inning. Now he's going to look to go to his fastball to finish it off against the young. Swinging a miss. Cleveland takes it home by the final score of 6-4. to four. A gutsy win here against a team who we don't really like. They beat us in the ALDS back in Season 2. We got our revenge in the wild card game the following season, but then they got the ultimate revenge by defeating us in the ALCS in five games just a season ago. Toronto did not hit the ball well, only five hits, but four of them were homers, so they hit their good power, but not contact. Our offense did nothing through the first four innings, but we really clutched up late with the home run by Pena in the fifth, and then, of course, the back-to-back -back homers by Marte and Ramirez in the eighth. Shout-out to the pitching. They did a great job. So let's simulate here through the next couple of series. There's two more games against Toronto, four in Detroit, and then three in Chicago. We sweep the Blue Jays, win three of four against the Tigers, and only one of two against the White Sox. The division looks very competitive, with us and the White Sox tied at 14-8. and eight. And then you've got the Twins only a game back, and the Royals only a game and a half back. So it seems like it's everybody right now other than the Tigers. Tigers in the race, which is ironic because last year it was just us and the Tigers. That'll wrap up the episode. Hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.